We ready to go, Jeff? Oh. I have the privilege this afternoon of introducing the Water Talk speaker for today. It, our speaker is Michael Bozak, who's going to talk about his PhD research. Mike has a rather substantial background in fisheries. He's currently a, a PhD student in the Department of Zoology and Physiology here at the University of Wyoming. He's working under Dr. Frank Rahill on a problem dealing with the influence of habitat on abundance of young of the year cutthroat trout. Mike received his master's degree from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point in 1981, and his bachelor's degree, or his, pardon me, his bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point in 1981, and his master's degree from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, in 1983. He has substantial professional experience. He worked in 1982 and 1983 for the University of Nevada at the Lake Mead Limnological Research Center, where he was looking at or working on endangered species in the Colorado River system. In 1984, he worked for the U.S. Forest Service in Idaho as a member of a fisheries, fisheries stream rehabilitation crew. And in 1985 and 1986, he worked for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, dealing with stream habitat inventory and mitigation methodologies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who's going to present a, a talk entitled Ecological and Statistical Differences in Habitat Used by Young Trout and Their Effects on Predicting Impacts from Water Withdrawals Using State-of-the-Art Hydrologic Models. Now that I've taken 15 minutes of his time with the title, I'll turn it over to him. Thanks, Wayne. Um, the, uh, the title is pretty big and it's, it's pretty brutal, um, but the information that we've collected in the past three years um, concerning Colorado River cutthroat trout is quite extensive. And there's a lot that goes into predicting impacts from water withdrawals. And so what I'm going to try and do is, is cover a broad range of topics that include variability in habitat use, constructing microhabitat models that look at the habitat that, are, that is actually being used, and how we make predictions um, with these models. So there's a lot of information, and we have collected quite a bit, but I've kind of scaled it down so the talk or the information isn't as bad as the title actually makes it sound. Stream systems, as many of us know, are highly variable systems, and they're variable in both time and space. And habitat features within streams that fish have to um, adjust to uh, seem to be changing constantly. And as fishery biologists and water resource managers, we have to take into account this variability over time and try and predict or try and assess what good habitat is. And in order to do that, we have to perform uh, different types of analyses. The focus of my talk is to key in on variable habitat in streams and variable habitat being used by Colorado River cutthroat trout fry. I'm going to, to look at this variability, see how it relates to fish, and then why this may be of concern. I'm going to introduce the species a little bit so we can talk and you guys can get familiar a little bit with um, some of the problems associated with that species. And then also talk about building habitat models, how they're built, um, and how they ultimately are used to make predictions on water withdrawal problems. If I could have the, the slides, please. Streams were fish live are highly variable systems, and there's two sources or two major sources of variability to look at. One of those sources is temporal variability in streams. And this occurs on a scale ranging anywhere from days to hours to years and beyond. And many of the things that change along this scale um, may change not only in hours, but may change seasonally, monthly, yearly. Things that, that we find that change, or, or some of the things that change, are stream flow, temperature, sunlight, food, water quality, species movement, species diversity, and habitat. Some of these are interrelated, and these are only a subset of many of the things that can vary. Because these things are constantly changing in streams, fish are adjusting to that changing habitat all the time, and it's making it difficult for biologists to assess what habitat they actually need. In addition to temporal variability, we also find spatial variability a problem in assessing habitats being used. Um, we see spatial variability of two types, both among streams, among different streams, and within the same stream. Things that differ are, once again, stream flow, elevation, aspect, geomorphology, 
riparian areas, longitudinal profile of streams, temperature, and species composition. Once again, many of these are interrelated, and yet um, there are, this is only a small fraction of the list. The interesting thing is that a single species of fish often has to adjust to a wide range of conditions where it's located. Some of these conditions are good or suitable habitat, which is what we wish to find out, and other conditions are poorer and sometimes causes problems in trying to assess what habitat fish need. Why this is of, an in of interest is because we need to address natural variability in systems and understand it before we can address variability caused by projects which man has some influence on. In particular, shown here is a picture of the North Fork Little Snake River drainage where water diversion projects are occurring. So we need to, need to be able to assess habitat requirements so that we can make predictions when man makes changes or alterations to the stream systems. This is a study victim in, in the study. It's a Colorado River cutthroat trout. It's a subspecies of the only uh, trout that's native to the state of Wyoming. Historically it occurred in the headwaters of the Colorado River in about seven of the Rocky Mountain states, but presently it's found in less than 1% of its former range. Reasons for the decline have been attributed to hybridization with rainbow trout, competition with brook trout, and, and brook trout have largely replaced the cutthroat throughout much of the range, and habitat alteration of the type that I'm going to deal with primarily today is water diversion. Apparently, the, the species is going to undergo a re-evaluation by states next year and is a potential candidate for the threatened species list. The population occurs in three drainages of the Colorado River Basin. Two of them are sub, sub Basin, or sub drainages of the Green River drainage, the upper Green River drainage here, and then the Black's Fork drainage, which is the lower Green River drainage, and the Little Snake River drainage in south central Wyoming. Now, if you look at this, the, the distribution of streams and the amount of water that's there, you would say, well, that's quite a bit of water for the Colorado River cutthroat trout. And indeed, the species did exist at one time in most of the headwater streams in, this, in these drainages. But because of, of the problems that I mentioned, it's now restricted to just several. Uh, streams in each of the drainages, several portions of, of these drainages, and uh, the population is, has been significantly reduced. The, uh, this is a, a shot of a North Fork Little Snake River drainage where we did a majority of our work. It contains the largest contiguous population of Colorado River cutthroat trout, and for this reason it's fairly important. In addition to that, it also contains genetically the, the purest strain of Colorado River cutthroat trout that seem to exist today. To ensure that, that the populations remain stable, the system had been reclaimed and a barrier ha had been installed along the Colorado-Wyoming border. Um, this is a picture of the barrier and it prevents in-migration of non-native salmonids, in particular the brook and rainbow trout, from reinvading the drainage. As a result of the protection and the reclamation effort, the only other species that exists in the drainage is the model sculpin, which is part of the natural or the native fish assemblage that occurred in that drainage. As I mentioned, the drainage is affected by a water diversion project. This is a water diversion structure uh, on one of the streams in the North Fork Little Snake River. Basically what the project does is it diverts water from the Colorado River Basin to the Platte River Basin across the Continental Divide. Now the, the, the life stage of the species that we're dealing with or we dealt with in our study is a fry life stage. It's a stage um, that occurs just after hatching it's about 25 to 35 millimeters in length, and it's usually associated with shallow water. And because of this association with shallow water, it's thought that it might be vulnerable to water withdrawals in particular. Because it, it potentially could cause, or there could be problems from water withdrawals, and we need to predict what those impacts may be, we need to assess the habitat that this species uses. So this led to the objectives of the study. Um, these are two of, of several objectives that we had. The first was to identify habitat use of Colorado River cutthroat trout fry. And we did this at two levels, and I'll describe both of those levels in a little bit. And the second is we had to assess variability in microhabitat use by Colorado River cutthroat trout from different streams and from different drainages to look at this variability question. For the first part of the first objective, we knew that streams in the North Fork Little Snake River drainage are highly variable. And what we wanted to know is what general habitat features were associated with Colorado River cutthroat trout fry abundance in those streams. So we looked at variability in these streams on the basis of geomorphic stream structure. We classified streams based on Rosgen's stream classification system, 
where he classifies streams to A, B, and C channels. A channels generally are steep gradient channels um, typified by large substrate size and considerable scouring. The opposite end of the spectrum are C channels, low gradient streams, uh, considerable deposition occurring, well developed riparian areas, which in some cases may even be wetlands. And intermediate in these stream channel types are B channels, uh, moderate substrate types, relatively equal amounts of scouring and deposition occurring in these systems, and a, a moderate gradient as well. Now we conducted our analysis on the North Fork Little Snake River drainage, and we selected 17 sites in the drainage. Uh, nine of those sites are on the main stem North Fork, so we could look at longitudinal variation in habitat on the main system. And we supplemented these sites with eight sites on tributary streams to look at various habitats that occur there as well. We selected sites on the basis of stream order, channel type, and gradient so that we could represent the, the types of habitats that actually occur in that drainage. In the drainage, we have first, second, and third order streams. And in the first and second order streams, there are also A, B, and C channel types that occur. In the uh, third order streams in the drainage, there are only B channels that are represented in the system. We quantified available habitat using point transect methods. And these methods are typical of many of the habitat analyses that are, are done on streams. Variables that we used in the model include mean depth, mean maximum depth, gradient, low flow discharge, width, mean velocity, bank stability, and spawning gravel abundance. And once again, many of these variables are, are similar variables that we use in habitat analysis. To show you that streams in the drainage were highly variable, um, I show here just some of the ranges of some of the variables that we looked at. Elevations of some of the streams range between 23 and 2,700 meters, gradient between 2 and 15.7%, Discharge between 0.01 and 4.25 CFS, width between 1.1 and 6.2 meters, and the mean maximum depth between 14 and 59 centimeters. So there was a wide range of habitats that are available to cutthroat trout fry. Because we wanted to see how fry density or abundance was related to these habitat variables, we quantified fry abundance. And we did this in these streams by using what we call streamside visual counts, where an individual uh, walks and, or basically crawls along the bank and counts the number of fry that he sees in each of, the, each of the sites that we selected. Fry density was also variable at those sites, and it ranged from zero to 100 fry per 100 meters squared. So fry density was also quite variable at those sites. To analyze the data, we conducted a multiple all subsets regression. And basically what we were told by the analysis was that fry density in numbers per meter squared was positively, positively related to spawning gravel and negatively related to mean maximum depth. Uh, the relationship was highly significant. So what does this mean? Well, it means that fry density was highest in shallow streams and streams with abundant spawning gravel. And you may say, well, that's nice. What does that mean? Well, and how does that relate to variability? The key is that we didn't find a relationship, or it didn't seem to find a relationship between channel type and fry density in those streams. Uh, the three highest densities we found were C, B, and A channels, and the three lowest were also C, B, and A channels. So it seemed that despite gross geomorphic differences in the, in the stream channels, um, those streams could provide a adequate habitat for fry if we had shallow, if the streams were shallow and if they had um, abundant spawning gravel. Of what importance is this information? It, it's nice from an ecological standpoint, but what does it, what does it do for us? Well, it's important in an applied sense in mitigation efforts where, where um, there may be some impact to some reaches of stream. If we can identify critical areas and if fry are the, the critical life stage that we're looking at, we can mitigate around these types of areas, protect these areas, and potentially if, if an impact, if there are choices to be made, other streams might be affected and we could, we could protect these areas. The problem is if there is an impact on a stream, this type of analysis doesn't do anything for us, is being able to predict how changes in stream flow, or if we do change the system, how the, the cutthroat trout fry are affected in that regard. So this led to the next part of the study, where we wanted to look at specific, the specific relationship between fry to environmental variables that are associated with them. And we are going to ultimately use this to predict impacts based on different flow regimes and streams. The objective was again to identify habitat variables, but this time at a finer scale, 
so I, to look at some of the variability in, in, the, in the habitats that are being used in the different channel types and uh, see what effect this has on predictions, on model predictions that I'll talk about a little bit later. To do this, we have to construct habitat models and we observe fish positions in streams and measure the microhabitat associated with each of those fish positions. There are many variables that can be used in the analysis, but primarily what's typically used are, or three of the major variables that are used are depth, velocity, and substrate, which I've illustrated on this uh, diagrammatic drawing. Each of, these, each of the positions of fry that we noted in the stream, we would measure these three variables associated with those. And this is also something to note now because we'll also measure these same variables in hydraulic models that we we'll use to simulate um, impacts later. So what are habitat models? Okay, it, very simply what they are is they're, they're a graphical representation of habitat that's being used by cutthroat or, or by any fish species. Um, the variable in this case, in this habitat model is depth. It's in centimeters and it ranges from zero to 20 centimeters. The y-axis shows the percent of fish or, or fry in this case that we saw at a given depth. What this habitat model basically tells us is that fry generally were found to use depths between about four and about 12 centimeters. It also tells us that shallower depths, zero to three, and deeper water, um, greater than 13 centimeters, probably isn't used if it's available at this site. There are problems with building habitat models, and I'm gonna talk about them a little bit later, um, but for right now, this is probably sufficient. We looked at microhabitat being used at uh, many sites over the three years, I'm gonna talk about three sites that we looked at in 1988 that have very different channel types. Once again, uh, A, B, and C channel types. In the North Fork Little Snake River drainage, we looked at Dead Man Creek and Harrison Creek. And the Green River drainage, we investigated um, habitat being used by fry on Lead Creek. These are three habitat use models or curves that were developed for those three streams. The top graph shows um, Dead Man Creek, which is the A channel, uh, the middle graph shows Harrison Creek, which is a B channel, and the bottom is Lead Creek, as I mentioned, the C channel. The x-axis on each of the graphs is velocity in meters per second, ranging from zero to well over 30 meters per second at each of the sites. And once again, the y-axis is the percent of fry that we observed at a given velocity. What, the graphs, or what these graphs show us on the three channel types is that habitat or velocities being selected by cutthroat fry generally less than about 0.06 meters per second at each site. And the distributions of the velocities being used are somewhat similar. Um, but as you can see, looking from Dead Man Creek down through Lead Creek, that there is a little bit of difference in those distributions. What we wanted to know from a statistical standpoint was, are these statistically different? So in so doing, we, we conducted a test called the Kolmogorov smirnov two-sample test. And what the test does, it looks for differences in means and variances among the three graphs, or among the three distributions, and uh, tells us if they are in fact different. Conducting that analysis, we found that the distributions in each of the three cases were significantly different from a statistical standpoint. I'd like to look at the next variable, which is total depth. These are the depths being used by cutthroat fry. Um, the top graph is Dead Man Creek, the middle graph is Harrison Creek, and the bottom graph again is Lead Creek, A, B, and C channels once again. The x-axis this time is total depth in centimeters, ranging from zero to well above 30 centimeters. And in each of the, the graphs as well, the y-axis is the percent of fry using a particular depth. Looking at these three curves, we can see that fry are using a wide range of, of depths that are available in those streams, ranging from two to well over 30 centimeters. The distributions are a little bit more, a little different um, when you compare them to what we saw in the velocities and this may be attributed to the types of habitats that are available in the streams, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in addition, we wanted to, to once again see if there were statistical differences in the distributions, we conducted the same test, and once again found statistically significant differences among the three, the three sites. <clears throat> Lastly, the third variable that I talked about was substrate, and these are um, the substrates associated with fry positions at each of the three sites. The top graph shows Dead Man Creek, the middle is Harrison Creek, and the bottom is Lead Creek. The x-axis this time are substrate size categories from one to nine, one being very small or very fine substrate, silts, uh, ranging all the way up to very large boulders, which is number nine. 
uh, once again, the, the y-axis are the percent of fry that were observed in association with a particular substrate type. As we can see from the three graphs, the substrates at each or, or that were being used by Colorado River cutthroat trout fry were quite a bit different. In Dead Man Creek, for instance, a majority of the, the cutthroat fry were using uh, rubble substrates, which are about 6 to 10 inches in diameter, where in Harrison and Lead Creek, they're using considerable smaller substrate sizes. So I want to summarize what I've just shown you a little bit. We've, we've looked at habitat use from three different channel, distinct channel types, or streams having three distinct channel types. And we found that there were significant differences in the microhabitats being used for each of the three variables. OK, from an ecological standpoint, again, that's nice. But the question is, so what? Well, first of all, in building habitat models, these are time consuming. And they're also very expensive, or fairly expensive, to conduct. And what we want to do is, if we're going to use these models to pre predict impacts, what we'd like to do is build a single habitat model that might represent habitat that fry will use regardless of the stream that it's uh, associated with. The problem is that usually when we build these models and we go to apply them, there are differences that, that I've just shown you. And this can result in false predictions that we would make at different sites on impacts. One proposed solution is to correct for environmental bias. And I'm just going to briefly talk about this. Basically, this is a three curves for Dead Man Creek. We have a, the depths that were used in Dead Man Creek. And this is the same graph that you saw before. These are the depths that were available at that site in the second graph here. And then the, the last graph is what we call a, a, a habitat suitability index model or preference curve. And what this model does is it tries to correct for environmental bias based on the habitat that's available at a site. At, Dead Man, at the Dead Man Creek site, we saw that there is a considerable amount of water that is fairly shallow. And as we get to deeper water, there's, it's less abundant. But what we find in Dead Man Creek is in, these, in the deeper water that is being used, it's being used in a higher proportion to that which is available. What the preference curve does is it, is it looks at this ratio, the relative use or use relative to what's available. And it, it puts on a relative scale um, the habitats that are actually preferred by fish. And this, to some degree, corrects for some of the bias. Now, it's on a relative scale, as I mentioned, this is 0 to 1. One being what's considered optimal habitat, or what fish would primarily choose to select, zero being habitats that are not used at all. These models are the, the types of models that we use in the simulations that I'll talk about. There is, however, one problem that in building the preference models and trying to correct for environmental bias, it often doesn't do a very good job. And as you can see, once again, these are the three streams, Dead Man Creek, Harrison Creek, and Lead Creek. And we're looking at total depth again that there are differences even when we try to correct for this environmental bias. So this type of an analysis may not do the job entirely, but these are the curves that we would have to use or we will use in the simulations. The next part of the talk we need to address, we have the models constructed, how do we apply them? Well, we, basically what we want to do is we want to predict the amount of habitat that are available to Colorado River cutthroat trout based on discharge. And what this graph shows is um, as discharge increases, habitat increases. And conversely, as, as discharge decreases, habitat decreases. And this decrease in habitat is what we're concerned about because this is what's associated with water withdrawals and uh, reduced habitat. How do, we, how do we assess this, or how do we assess this situation? Well, we look at an, uh, an analysis called a physical habitat simulation, which is a, a methodology, it's part of a, method, a larger methodology used by the Fish and Wildlife Service to predict how changes in stream flow uh, affect fish populations or fish habitat. What the analysis does is it links a habitat model. And I showed you the habitat models before. And these habitat models show you what fish actually use or prefer to use with a hydraulic model, which basically tells you what the stream has or, the, or what kind of habitat is available to fish at a particular stream. And then it makes a prediction in units that we call weighted usable area units. And for right now, I'm just going to say that weighted usable area basically is the area of a stream um, that has suitable habitat for a particular species of fish. I'm going to take you through the, the hydraulic simulation part and how the data is collected. And we're going to do a little math in just a second. Um, so I hope I can, I can uh, ex explain this so that you can understand it quite well. 
to conduct uh, the hydraulic simulation portion of the, the analysis, stream is divided using survey techniques into what we call homogeneous cells. Each cell, there are habitat variables that are measured in association with that cell, and these are the same variables that we use in the habitat, habitat models. Um, the three variables that, we'll, that we measure in, in this analysis are the depth, the velocity, and the substrate. And uh, in, in addition to that, each cell has an area, a surface area, associated with these. To predict weighted usable area, we have to combine the three variables, the depth, velocity, and substrate variables, or their suitabilities, um, so that we can go ahead and make predictions on weighted usable area. How do we do that? It's done this way. We combine the habitat models that we made earlier. These are, this is the, the habitat model in the range from 0 to 1, once again with measurements that we took in each of the cells. This is a, a single cell, and I've just made up several values just to demonstrate the point. In this particular cell, we have depths being used by Fry 0.05 meters. We take the depth curve, that's or the curve that's associated with depth that we made with the Colorado River Cutthroat Trout Fry, and we follow this value up and, and get the suitability index number that's associated with that. And we, for right now, we'll, we'll place it right here, but we do that for each of the three variables. I'm not showing a velocity or substrate curve, but basically we do the same thing in each of these cases and come up with a different value depending on, on the habitats that are being used for those cells. As I mentioned before, we also have to look at cell area for each of these to, to uh, calculate weighted usable area. The next step in the process is for each cell, we have to calculate a composite suitability index. Now those habitat suitability numbers are multiplied together, the 0.6, 1, and 0.4, um, to come up with this index. And for this cell, it's 0.24. We take that value for this cell, and we multiply it by, this, by the cell area, which in this case was 50 meters squared. And the value that we get is 12 meters squared, which is a weighted usable area unit. Now, there might be a problem, and you may have a question at this time, because I indicated that the cells were fairly homogeneous units. And if that's the case, how can I tell you that we have 12 areas that are suitable habitat and yet 38 aren't? Well, what, what weighted usable area is, is it's a relative term. And what, what it is equal to is if we have a cell that has a perfect suitability, 1.0, or is optimal habitat for fry, and that cell is 12 meters squared, it has 12 meters weighted usable area units. So our stream that's 50, 50 meters squared has the same habitat value as a stream that is only 12 meters squared that has optimal habitat. And these are the, this is how the habitat, uh, uh, the weighted usable area and the simulation information is analyzed. The last thing we do is we look at um, the weighted usable areas for each cell in the, uh, under a given flow regime. And then we add those up and we get a total weighted usable area for that stream. We do the same thing under different flow regimes because the depths, velocities, and substrates that we measured will change under different conditions. And we come up with weighted usable areas under different flow conditions. And these are the, these are the, the values that we're going to make predictions from. These are some of the, the, the predictions that we made at some of the sites. We used hydraulic simulation data that was previously collected by an individual named Steve Wolf who got his degree here. I helped him collect the information on uh, in this case, Harrison Creek. The microhabitat models that we simulate from were Dead Man Creek and Harrison Creek, and you saw those, uh, the, the data that I just showed you. We simulated stream flows between 1 and 5 CFS in each case and predicted weighted usable area and percent weighted usable area, which is basically the weighted usable area divided by the available stream habitat. What these values show us is, first of all, that large increases in stream flow or decreases in stream flow don't result in, in very big changes to a large degree um, in weighted usable area. And that the weighted usable area overall for cutthroat trout fry at this site is quite small. What it also shows is that as we decrease, as flows are decreasing, in the case of fry, we are increasing habitat, at least uh, to a, a small degree. But I also talked about variability a little bit. And as we can see, between the two sites that were statistically significantly different, we also see differences in the predictions of the amount of habitats that are being used. And this is an indication of problems that we would have in using models in streams that are 
that are different than where the, the data were actually collected. And I will talk about that again in just a little bit. We did a, a series of simulations, and here's a, another site. This one, the hydraulic simulation data is from the North Fork Little Snake River. And the once again, the same microhabitat use data that I just presented, Dead Man Creek and Harrison Creek. In this case, the simulations were between 4 and 12 CFS. And the reason for this is because we're simulating data within the ranges of the stream flow that was available when the data were collected. The analysis doesn't do a very good job beyond the ranges that the data was collected. And so therefore, predictions beyond these two points um, are not very reliable. And so we don't simulate beyond them. Once again, we see similar results. Fry habitat makes up a generally a small portion of the total stream channel. And weighted usable area seems to increase once again as we have decreasing flows in this case. In addition, once again, the statistical differences that we saw in the habitats being used are being uh, illustrated here with the differences between the Dead Man Creek and the same flows for Harrison Creek. So I'd like to just kind of summarize some of the hydraulic simulation information that I just provided. We seem to find that habitats seem to increase with, with decreasing flows. We seem to see a small change in weighted usable area with every large change in um, stream flow, those one CFS units. We also found out that there was a small area of stream that's suitable habitat for fry in each of the cases, and that predictions were actually different among streams um, that we were finding with differences in habitats that were being used. So we see differences in weighted usable area. The, the big question is, we didn't see big changes, and are the values in weighted usable area that are being predicted actually true values, or are they actually related to what is actually happen, happening in the streams? But we don't feel that in the case of Colorado River cutthroat trout fry that the simulations did a very good job. Um, the simulation models, as you'll remember, break the stream into homogeneous, homogeneous cells. And if you look at this site, which is one of the sites the data was collecting at, it's very difficult to break this stream into homogeneous cells. There are very different velocities in very small areas, large pieces of large substrate in many areas, and all types of small microhabitats that are actually being created by the stream. What this does is, when we collect the, the information on each of the cells, we, we calculate a velocity that's a 6 tenths velocity, and this represents all the velocities in that cell. But because fry are so small, they can get behind many of these small boulders in the streams or even small rocks. And this may be, in fact, suitable habitat for fry. But this model and this simulation in these streams doesn't seem to be able to, to detect these changes, at least the pr presently the way the data is collected. I might also add that in streams that may have more laminar flow, this type of analysis might be more practical and the, the data more valuable in that regard. This is just to illustrate the point that I just made. Here are two cutthroat trout fry using habitat in an area where the velocities are in excess of those that they would normally see. The, the first fry is, is actually using this stick for a velocity block. And the fry in front of it is coming up and catching food items that are coming by and dropping back down. This occurs at such a fine micro scale that the simulations that we conducted aren't picking up this type of area that might be considered weighted usable area for fry. And therefore, the simulations don't seem to be doing a, a very good job. Another problem that we have with simulations is we have to assume that the variables that we measured are, are actually the causal variables that are associated with um, changes in weighted usable area and fish populations. In, in other words, the three variables that we measured, we're assuming are those that are driving the system and that are affecting the populations. This may or may not be the case in many of these analyses. And one of the complaints has been that none of these analyses include a food component that we can see here with the fry just about to eat a small uh, particle of food drifting down. This is a, a real big problem. And if we're simulating with, with information, depth, velocity, and, and substrate, but in fact, the system is driven by some other variable, in this case, I'm showing food, that in fact, the simulations may do nothing for us. Now, I've said a lot of bad things about the simulations in regards to fry. There are also good points, too, that, that I, just to be fair, I, I have to make. First of all, a good point is it's, it's a very good attempt at combining a hydraulic system with the actual habitats that are being used by fry. And in this regards, it's about, at least to, uh, at present, it's, it's state-of-the-art technology for attempting to address problems with impacts 
how habitat changes with changing flows. The other thing is the analysis, even though it's expensive, I've indicated that you may have to conduct the analysis on a finer scale, which requires more time and effort. Well, you have to balance cost, complexity, and accuracy in order to make these predictions. And if we're going to increase the amount of work that we need to increase accuracy, uh, the cost may become prohibitive. So there might be other things that, that may need to be done in order to make the analyses more accurate. Whoops. Just pop back. So I just want to summarize the, the presentation. First of all, we found that fry were associated with shallow water and, uh, and spawning, ha or, uh, spawning gravel. And this was valuable from a mitigation standpoint where we can have trade-offs between sites. But if we couldn't do this, we have to do some type of simulation. We made predictions with weighted usable area, and we found that weighted usable area for fry, at least in this instance, were quite small, although it did differ among channel types. And uh, we found that we might need a finer uh, scale of an analysis in order to pick up fry habitat simulations in these types of systems. And lastly, we saw that microhabitat being used was statistically significantly different among sites. And even when we adjusted for bias, these differences were still inherent. What this may tell us is that optimal habitat actually may be different for fry in different streams. There may be some other variables associated with habitat that we may not be measuring, or in fact, there may be differences in the, in the different populations of fish that may affect weighted usable area as well. And therefore, um, we need to, in using simulations, um, Use, ha use habitat information on sites where hydraulic simulation data is collected to try to correct, additionally correct for some of the bias. Thank you. Any questions? Ooh. I'll ask a question just to <laughs> get things rolling. Given the results of your research, do you feel that the late summer stream flows in the Little Snake River drainage on the streams that have been diverted as part of the Stage 2 Cheyenne Water Project, are those current flows limiting the abundance of cutthroat trout through the impacts on Young of the Year fish? Well, the, the late summer flow, right now in the North Fork Little Snake River, there are minimum flows that are set for all of the streams. Um, the late summer flows that when fry emerge in late August um, are generally below these minimum levels. In other words, um, water diversion can occur at, at higher levels, but once the natural stream flow falls below a certain level, the city of Cheyenne can no longer divert water. So what we're looking at in, in the case of the North Fork Little Snake River drainage at these times on the tributary streams is no, there are no longer diversions occurring at that time. And so therefore what we're seeing is actual natural variation for fry habitat um, information that we're collecting. What it doesn't do is tell you how this reduced flow earlier in the year is actually affecting the stream geomorphology at that time. We may be seeing increased uh, deposition in many of the areas of the streams because the high flushing flows in the spring were, um, that normally would come in and clean gravels and, and affect some of the habitat um, are now being deposited in, in many of these reaches. And so we don't know what the effects are, but I know some work at the water centers is presently being conducted to address that, some of that to some degree. I, I, I think it differs with, with site, first of all. Um, the, the first analysis showed that if you have abundant spawning gravel, you'll have lot, uh, quite an abundant amount of fry. And at sites like that, um, there is no problem with, with fry habitat, or there doesn't seem to be problems with fry habitat and spawning gravel. There are other sites where that may be a problem, um, but, but in, at least in those sites, that is not. On some sites, you have very low flows. Um, you may have Overwintering habitat seems to be a big question in a lot of people's minds. Flows are so low in the winter, and you get ice on top of that, and then the, there isn't much habitat or much space available for the adult fish at that time of year. Another problem in the drainage is because of its high elevation, it's cold, so the growing season is short, but food avail availability appears to be very limiting at that time. And in many cases, and I mentioned food availability a little bit, uh, that may be driving uh, the system quite a bit. We'll see fish, I think the biggest fish in the drainage are probably about nine, nine to 10 inches long. And those fish may be six to eight years old. 
from, from some stuff that I've seen in the past. So food definitely is a limiting factor, um, but this is also combined with, with the, the, the growing season as well, which is fairly short. So it depends on the site, and it might be site specific as to what may be problems in different areas. Mike, you suggested that with the uh, PHAB sim methodology, we might need to go towards detail mm -hmm. to make that a more uh, accurate prediction. For example, collecting information on food abundance. Mm -hmm. You think we could, in fact, go the other direction and just, say, focus on water velocity with the idea that substrate and uh, water depth are not that important in the actual choice of habitat. It's water velocity, and that's highly correlated with drift. So maybe we can go the other direction and actually make it simpler and then use resources to measure water velocity at a smaller mm -hmm. scale. Actually, the, the three variables that we looked at, and we looked at other variables as well, but depth velocity and substrate that we use in the analysis, substrate drops out pretty quick. It, it doesn't seem to, to have much influence. Um, it, it doesn't seem to have any biological significance, I guess is the way to look at it. So that leaves two things. It leaves depth and it leaves velocity. And it, it's a very good point. Um, as long as the velocities that you're looking at are associated with drift lanes, if that's driving the, you know, the, the system, then that's, that's fine and that may be true. The, the other indication from some other analysis that I've looked at or, or studies that I've done is to drop out the depth variable might not be very wise. And the reason for this is we'll find in, in, in pools that vary in size fry that are associated with some of the shallow, what I'll call shelf areas, and fry that are also associated with some of the deeper water. Generally speaking, and this is just observational, I need to, to dig into the data a little more, bigger fry are associated with the deeper water, but the velocities may in fact be the same. Now what significance is there to, to, the, to the depth variable? It, it's it's kind of simple. Basically you have a, a larger cross section of stream passing by a fish and therefore more drift. And so I think the combination of the depth and the, and the velocity variable um, actually are, are, are good to have in the analysis and depth probably isn't the one to drop out. You'll have the same velocities of the smaller fry that you will see in shallower water, but, but you don't have as much water coming through at that location, and so a fish doesn't have as much to pick from. And he's got the same lateral movement, but he doesn't have the, the same up and down area to work with as one that, that is in, that's found in deeper water. Uh, you're aware of the large sediment spill in Green Timber Creek in mm -hmm. 1988. Mm -hmm. Siphon failure where approximately 2,000 cubic yards of various size substrate entered the system. Uh, from my experience, there's a lot more spawning gravel in that system than there was historically, plus the way that deposits entered the system and were contained behind debris, it spread out and made the water shallower. Mm -hmm. For a long-term prediction, do you think that's going to be a better nursery stream than it was prior to the spill? Um, I saw the spill right after it happened. I was there probably a month or so afterwards, and I've been and I've been there since. There has been some rehabilitation efforts on the stream. Um, I had the exact same comment that you had. There's probably more spawning habitat in there than, than there has ever been. Um, I thought that was a real shot in the arm for green timber as far as spawning habitat. Uh, the question is, how are the increased numbers of fry, or if we're going to have, I can't say that there are, if we're going to have in increased numbers of fry associated with those spawning gravel, how is that going to affect adult populations? You said we have shallower water, so is that going to affect the adult populations in the long run? And right now I can't say that I know, except some of the stream rehabilitation has addressed some of that. You have deeper pools. But I, I definitely believe that the additional gravel that's now in that system and is, is, re is retained by a lot of the log drop structures is going to provide spawning habitat for quite a long period of time. There's no other source. There's not a very good source of gravel in that system. And as you know, it's, it's, a very, it's in a, into a valley, and uh, so it, it's kind of an incised channel. You, d you don't have a lot of gravel source. So that happened um, to be, in, at least in my estimation, something that may benefit in the long run. Mike, if you measured substrate uh, and velocity down to a, a fineness that you were able to measure the velocity behind substrate, you know, where you might have slow micro habitat for mm -hmm. velocity. Do you think maybe then there, there may be more of a relationship between uh, substrate and velocity? You know, Frank mentioned you might be able to drop substrate out, you know, as a, a variable. And, uh, and there's not a lot of correlation there, you mentioned. Well, do you think 
you're just missing the importance of substrate size because you're just measuring the same temperature. Um, yeah, I, I could probably answer that pretty quick in, in, a, in an unbiased way. Um, after observing um, probably thousands of fry, um, I can't see the significance of, of substrate in, the, in that life stage of this fish. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything that, that is associated with things that I see going on. The one exception might be, and I, but I haven't observed it, is if in fact fry are associated with the finer substrates, like I showed in two of the sites, they, and they feed on chironomids, and chironomids are abundant in the substrate type, then you know, this may in fact be a variable we, we don't want to drop out. But I haven't seen that. I've seen fry that spend 100% of their, or about 90% of the day um, spending feeding on drift that comes through in drift lanes. And so um, I don't see any biological significance to substrate. And so I, I really couldn't say, I, I don't see a reason to have it. I don't think a finer scale is going to do it. Um, something that might have some effect is uh, looking at another, another variable, which, which I would call a laminar variable. Fry don't seem to be in turbulent water whatsoever. I don't know if they can't, the one, they can't see stuff coming through, but they have a hard time holding position to feed. How do you measure that in the field? I don't know, but it might be a better variable than looking at substrate size. Um, so, yeah, but I don't see substrate as being, a, you know, even if you measure it at a finer level, being of much value. Okay, sounds good, thank you.